What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin and Markets. Today, we're going to go over a few stories of the last 24 hours that I thought were interesting. Stand by. So I was testing Twitch to see if Twitch was going to work today, and it was, and it was giving me feedback in my headphones. So yeah, you guys can catch me on Twitter, at Ansel Lindner, live streaming there, YouTube, BTC Market Update is the channel. Also, Telegram, t.me forward slash Bitcoin and Markets is the channel. Lots of stuff going on there, so check it out. Join that Telegram if you would like to. And the website is BitcoinandMarkets.com. You can sign up for free email notifications as well as support the show over there. And, of course, Twitch. I just set that up. I don't know if anybody is over there on Twitch watching Bitcoin content, but we are there as well. Okay, what you're seeing is the website just put out the market pro number nine talking about is the Bitcoin consolidation over? Uh, we looked at all sorts of different charts. Bitcoin is looking really good. Uh, also looked at detailed dive into GBTC, looking at how the premium and the discount affected the price throughout this last cycle. It just happens that February of 2021, the premium turned into a discount and that was also pretty much the top. You know, that after that first run up, that was the top. Then the bottom in July of 2021 also corresponded with the bottom in the releases of GBTC, you know, the unlock periods uh, or tranches or whatever you want to call them of GBTC shares. That also coincided with the bottom there. And then we had a little bit of a reflation and a sell off. So I make some speculation about how the industry was leveraged on this GBTC premium trade. Billions and billions of dollars were locked up into GBTC and you can make this a risk-free trade by then shorting the secondary market. So you short the premium and you long the nav and you can lock in that spread and just harvest that spread. I think that led to a lot of um, infrastructure in the space. Leverage plays, leverage companies, BlockFi, Celsius, other things. They were all built around this quote-unquote risk-free trade. It is risk-free. However, the premium can disappear. And once the premium disappears, that doesn't necessarily affect those individual traders. Those trades that happened were paid out the you know they were locked in the profit was locked in and stuff but what it does is that the infrastructure of the entire space businesses like blockfi that were based off of giving clients returns based on this risk free trade once that goes away now these businesses can't pay their depositors now they have problems and that leverage starts breaking down in the system that's why we, after July of 2021, we saw a little bit of reflation, topped out and started back down again because they could, these businesses were based on this risk-free trade. Anyway, so I think it's very important to be watching the GBTC news, whether it turns into an ETF, that's very, very important for the space, as well as the discount, whether the discount disappears. So there is this kind of uh, cycle I would, I'm assuming there's going to be a cycle to GBTC's premium and discount. And if it remains a trust, there's two other concerns, uh, follow-on concerns of GBTC. And that is, it's going to become a huge honeypot for governments. That is kind of an attack factor. You know, they, they have, um, I think they had, they still have over 600,000 Bitcoins and Let's say that doubles again once it goes back into premium. You're talking over a million Bitcoins as a centralized honeypot for these governments. Uh, so anyway, that's an important attack surface to watch. And I've lost my train of thought <laughs> what the next concern was. Uh, just even if it goes into uh, discount or premium, how the that affects the 
infrastructure of the space, whether they're, you know, we build back again towards leverage, which I think is possible, but much less likely, and it'll probably be much less irrational exuberance than the first time around. So anyway, I detail that out in the market pro. Uh, if you guys want to sign up for that, you can use Bitcoin and markets.com forward slash pro 50 to get your first month 50% off. Um, okay. That's enough on the website. Let's take a quick look at the chart and you can see we're green on the day up three and a half percent. Stocks are also up. Let's take a quick look at the stock market. Huge day for the stock market. Gapped higher and still pushing higher. And this is amazing. I mean, I saw a headline on Zero Hedge. How come the stocks don't seem to be falling? You know, like, come on, people. If, you know, there is a saying that markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent, but markets also know more than you do. So which one are you going to go? Are you going to go to zero? Your balance, your solvency goes to zero before you reevaluate your assumptions or are you going to reevaluate your assumptions? So anyways, this is exactly what I've been expecting. Um, oil is recovering slightly and we'll take a look at the dollar. It is also green on the day. So this relationship between green on the stock market, green on Bitcoin and green on the dollar is very interesting. And nobody, I don't think anybody other than myself has a working thesis to explain this. Why we can see a day where we're green on all three of those things. But anyway, so that is the charts. Let's get into this first tweet thread. Um, so let me just tell you what I'm going to go over today. This tweet thread by Bitcoin only, or it's at Bitcoin freed me. Then we're going to talk quickly about banks taking over for Signature and Silvergate. There are some new banks coming in to the system and serving Bitcoin clients. So that is an interesting article. I'm going to read through that. Also, this news coming out of Florida, my home state now, uh, Florida bill banning CBDCs might accidentally ban Bitcoin too. This is from BlockWorks. We're going to read through that. And if we have time, I'm going to touch on this article from the Financial Times, money pulled from Eurobanks at record rate in February. All right, that's a little bit older article, but we might get to it. So let's go back to this Twitter thread from Bitcoin Freed Me, and I'll read through this. I'm a senior level finance person at a publicly traded financial services company. Those of us in the echo chamber get annoyed that folks, quote, just don't get it, end quote. I work with highly educated individuals and they just don't get it. Why? Because our message just doesn't translate. All of our legitimate criticisms of monetary debasement and its effects on the elimination of the middle class, well, they are too busy with their day-to-day -to, -day to follow the cascading effects of government, Fed, central bank decisions. This message must be succinct for a 30-second soundbite on mainstream media, a New York Times ad, or a billboard in every major state. If you feel the message is incomplete, remember, you're not selling. Over time, Bitcoin sells itself. As messengers, it is our role to create the spark. So what's the message? All right, so the message was too complicated. We need a better elevator pitch for Bitcoin. And here is what he or she recommends. So what's the message? Number one, Bitcoin is money for the internet. Number two, Bitcoin has limited supply. As more adopt, price will increase. Number three, Bitcoin is an emerging alternative asset. You should have at least a small percentage of your wealth in these alternative assets. Number four, USD used to be backed by a scarce asset, gold. It helps it maintain its value. This is why we heard stories in the past of people being millionaires by keeping money in their mattress. Impossible today. USD and all world currencies are melting ice cubes. This isn't quite correct, but I, I understand what he's saying here. Number five, I am sure you have heard lots of scary stuff about quote unquote crypto. There is a difference between crypto and Bitcoin, but we need not get into that. Just remember, the car was shat on by horse buggy manufacturers. Those with will do everything in their power 
to protect. In closing, I suggest you take a small position in Bitcoin. Don't invest anything you will need to touch for at least five years. You need not be as confident as I am. At a minimum, view it as a small bet with significant upside. Okay, um, very interesting. I added to this on Telegram, and I'm going to scroll up and find that. I'm going to go over his points again and then uh, add mine, my two cents or two sats, however you want to say that. All right, so he said money is, or Bitcoin is money for the internet. Bitcoin has a limited supply, and Bitcoin is a merging alternative asset. I would add Bitcoin is backed by Bitcoin, like gold is backed by gold, because one of the things that the talking points is that Bitcoin is unbacked. So we need to drive home that Bitcoin is backed by Bitcoin, just like gold is backed by gold. That's a very easy soundbite to get across to people. Think about gold settlement anywhere in the world in 10 minutes. The next one I said, uh, it's global and amorphous. It can't be changed by a single central party because then the rest of the world won't consider it valid. And so getting into why the code can't be changed because it's global, it's distributed or decentralized, and you would have to change the code on every node and convince everybody that the new code is legitimate. And if it's a central power trying to do that, well, obviously people won't agree with that and there will be a fork. So you can't stop the original chain, the original network. Uh, you can only create a new network. All right. The next one I have here, this actually would be like number seven or something for his list. It's programmable. You can design repo or any modern financial contracts and cryptographically sequester Bitcoin. You can't do that on the existing system, right? So this is not only money for the internet. It's also programmable money for the internet. It's gold that can be settled anywhere and it's programmable. People don't quite understand when you say that it's programmable money. So it's best to say an example. And that's why I say you can design repo contracts. You can design other modern financial contracts in the plumbing of the system. Uh, you can sequester Bitcoin. You can do all sorts of things in that nature. These are smart contracts just based off very simple multi-sig, time lock, that type of stuff that Bitcoin can be used for, that you can't have anything like that in the traditional financial system. Okay, the next one, I say buying some Bitcoin doesn't mean you have to only ever use Bitcoin or that you can think, think it's going to win immediately. These things take time. One of the worst outcomes that I had in evangelizing Bitcoin, which is one reason why I don't now ever say really evangelize Bitcoin. This is just, these tips are, you know, the 30 second elevator pitch. If you are going to be talking about them, here's some ideas. But people buy Bitcoin because they think it's going up and then they obviously set, buy at the top and sell at the bottom. They sell on the first dip. And in the last cycle, I had a really, well, it was an acquaintance of mine. And they lost a lot of money because they had weak hands and they sold on the first dip. So very important to tell them, you know, this takes time. You don't even have to think about it. Bitcoin freed me guy. He did say, hey, you know, think of it as a five year time horizon. And I think that is the right way to go. Five, even 10 years. Think about it as a college savings account type time frame. You know, you're going to put this in there and, and not touch it for 10, 15 years. That's how you should think of your Bitcoin investment. And just because you do invest in Bitcoin doesn't mean you have to think in Bitcoin. You don't have to use Bitcoin. Um, that's another thing in the Bitcoin space is everyone tries to tell you to use your Bitcoin all the time. Well, uh, yes, some people will do that and that's fine. I have no problem with that. Everybody is uniquely following their own individual incentives. But just because you buy Bitcoin doesn't mean you have to spend it. Other people will spend it. Other people will build the ecosystem out because they are following their incentives. So, and then I added one more. I said, Bitcoin is like a new element, better than gold. It is, in, it is a fact of nature now that it exists and you can't wish it away or wish that others won't want it or wish that others won't beat you to it, right? So that's the, a big thing too, is to kick them in the butt. Uh, in a sales pitch, which this isn't really a sales pitch, okay? This is just trying to explain Bitcoin. But, you know, you always want to say, oh, it's for a limited time. That gets people 
there, right? That gets people to buy now instead of waiting. And so if you tell them like, yeah, this is a fact of nature now and wishing it away won't help. Wishing that, you know, other people won't want it, won't help. They're just going to beat you to it. That, that usually convinces people, I think. So anyway, very interesting thread here by Bitcoin only. Uh, let's get on to the next story. This one is out of the Wall Street Journal. I have it archived here. That's what I shared on Telegram. And guys, listening to this on the podcast version, when I put these out as a podcast audio only, I do link to all of these things on my website, BitcoinMarkers.com. So you can find that there in short order, or you can just join the Telegram and you'll see all the links that I post every single day. Okay, the headline, banks set up to serve crypto firms after signature Silvergate blow up. Some banks are rolling out the welcome mat for cryptocurrency firms that found themselves in need of banking services after the downfall of two big crypto friendly lenders, Signature Bank and Silvergate Capital. As crypto companies have scrambled to establish new banking relationships, industry executives say they have received a positive reception from regional banks such as Customers Bank Corps based in West Reading, Pennsylvania, and Fifth Third Bank Corp, based in Cincinnati. Other crypto firms are moving deposits to smaller upstart banks that tout themselves as digital pioneers, such as New Jersey-based Cross River Bank. Still, others are considering taking their banking business offshore. Meanwhile, with the biggest banks, such as J.P. Morgan Chase and the bank New York Mellon, still do business with crypto clients, though they are selective about their client list and what banking services they provide. So just to stop here real quick, this was a huge blow to the scam side of the house. Even somewhat legitimate businesses that offered altcoin services, um, this was a huge blow to this part of the ecosystem. And a lot of people were worried that this was Operation Choke Point 2.0, which you'll, we get into here in the next paragraph. Um, but it doesn't seem like that is working out so well because there are lots of other alternatives. It just takes a while. And it is a cycle, business cycle within the Bitcoin ecosystem where the worst off offenders will go bankrupt or insolvent or they'll go get arrested or, you know, whatever. Um, so this is just all part of the cycle. Let's continue. A few weeks ago, Bitcoin circles were abuzz with talk that Washington was plotting to kill crypto by cutting off its access to the banking system in what some commentators dubbed Operation Choke Point 2.0. Those fears have now somewhat abated as banks have stepped up to fill the vacuum created by Silvergate and Signature. Quote, there are dozens of other banks, both onshore and offshore, that are taking advantage of this opportunity, said Rich Rosenblum, co-founder and president of Bitcoin trading firm GSR. Banks willing to service crypto firms have been inundated with applications during the past two weeks, crypto executives and bankers said. After the collapse of Signature, one crypto banker said he enabled his phone's do not disturb mode to get some sleep. We received so many texts in rapid, rapid succession that the phone overrode the setting. Very interesting. This also reminds me of what CK said last week on FedWatch from his connections in the Ethereum space, that there are hundreds of Wells notices going out to all of these small, medium-sized scams that were around the space that had bank accounts. You know, they're all probably trying to find replacements. Um, and they probably won't. A lot of these players won't. I mean, if you have a Wells notice from the SEC, you're probably not going to get an account at a new bank. But anyway, let's continue. Crypto trading firm B2C2 Limited is applying for 20 bank accounts across multiple currencies, according to its CEO. The smaller banks that are open to crypto clients have been selective about whom they take on, dragging out the time it takes to establish accounts. Bankers and crypto executives say one concern from the bank side is that they don't want to have too much exposure to crypto for fear that it will make them a target for regulators. Very interesting. So it's not the speculative nature of the assets. It's the speculative nature of the regulations. Oh, that's very interesting. 
uh, quote, we believe that there is a set of U.S. banks that is likely to onboard some of the crypto firms with a smaller concentration in each bank than previously, said Michael Shalov, chief executive of crypto infrastructure startup Fireblocks, Inc. Fireblocks recently started banking with Fifth Third, people familiar with the matter said. The startup declined to comment on its own bank relationship. A spokesman for Fifth Third said that as a matter of corporate policy, the bank doesn't engage in the business of banking companies that trade or directly handle crypto. He added, quote, we recognize the need that all companies, including digital asset companies, have for traditional banking services, including payroll benefits and accounts payable, end quote. Attracting deposits from crypto firms could help shore up banks' balance sheets at a time when a string of failures have shaken the confidence in the banking system, but it is a risky gambit. Bank regulators have raised concerns about lenders' involvement in crypto while the Securities and Exchange Commission's aggressive pursuit of crypto firms has alarmed bankers who don't want to do business with customers in the agency's crosshairs. This is a point that a lot of Bitcoiners are making, uh, that this could shore up the balance sheets of banks, adding reserves, adding reserves that don't, don't have counterparty risk. This is Bitcoin, of course, not crypto, but Bitcoin could shore up these banks' balance sheets. The banks that go out there and are going to take on board a lot of these scams they're actually weakening themselves, in my opinion. Now, if they take on Bitcoin companies, it depends on which Bitcoin company it is. If the bank is going to hold Bitcoin, that would be great. If they, the bank could hold Bitcoin for these companies, I'm, I'm sure the small banks aren't, but these large banks might be. There's obviously a lot of talk about that in the last couple of years. Okay, let's continue. Silvergate and Signature were attractive for crypto trading firms because they ran payment networks that let clients move dollars between each other on a 24-7 basis, making it possible to settle crypto for dollar trades outside normal banking hours. The loss of Silvergate's SEN network and the threat of losing Signature's Signet network threw a wrench in the plumbing of crypto markets. Now crypto firms have been looking to move to regional banks that offer or are developing similar networks, such as customers and Phoenix-based Western Alliance Bank Corp. People familiar with the matter said, quote, losing SEN and Signet is operationally disruptive, but there are a number of regionals that are also building out these networks and services, said Rob Rutherford, Vice President of Operations at Falcon X, a digital asset prime brokerage catering to institutions. Uh, this is also interesting because these, these large players, high net worth individuals, large institutions that are wanting to get in to Bitcoin, they will be served. And these boutique companies like this Falcon X sounds like, you know, it's a prime brokerage catering to, in, catering to institutions. They'll probably get banked a lot easier than people that are serving the small guy, the guy with four uh, monkey face NFTs, right? Th those are those customers, the companies with those customers, they're not going to get banked as easily as these big companies that serve big customers like Falcon X. That's just another interesting wrinkle to think about. Among the larger banks, JP Morgan continues to provide banking services to crypto clients such as crypto exchange Coinbase Global Inc. BNY Mellon holds cash and treasuries for stablecoin issuer Circle. Other crypto firms have eyed offshore banks such as Puerto Rico's FV Bank or Capital Union Bank in the Bahamas, industry executives said. Quote, the closure of Signature and Silvergate have prompted an increase in the inquiries for prospective clients, FV Bank CEO Miles Pashini said. As regulated banks and digital asset custodian, we can offer firms who meet our strict compliance and risk requirements access to an integrated solution. All right. So very interesting. There is a lot of action happening right now on the banking front in the space, of course. Um, this is going to obviously take out the worst offenders out of the ecosystem, but the big guys are going to continue 
and the, also the bank, the Bitcoin only companies are going to continue much more likely than the crypto company. Very interesting. All right, let's look at this story out of Blockworks, and the headline is Florida Bill Banning CBDC Might Accidentally Ban Bitcoin 2. The uh, subheadline, the House Commerce Committee reportedly voted 15 to 5 in favor of passing a bill that blocks the use of a federally backed CBDC under Florida law. So this is a very interesting bill because the Constitution says that the government, the, the federal government has the ability to mint coins, you know, has the control over the money. The states don't have any right to mint their own money. The federal government also has the amount, uh, the right to fix the weights and measures. So dollars being a certain number of grains of silver or grains of gold or whatever like that. So all of that power is strictly limited to the federal government. But now this Florida bill is banning any CBDC that is federally issued. Another very interesting wrinkle about this story is that the Federal Reserve, our central bank, which is in the name of this central bank digital currency, CBDC, our central bank is not technically part of the government. It's a private bank. It has private shareholders. The Wall Street banks are shareholders of the Federal Reserve. I mean, we don't know for sure, but that is the generally accepted idea. Do they have the power to issue a CBDC? No. There, there, there will have to be a different acronym for federally issued digital currency, FIDC. FIDCs, are they banned in Florida? I don't know. But th this is a constitutional question that I think is interesting. Now, the other kind of controversy is over the exact wording in this bill. Supposedly, it says uh, there is a small problem with DeSantis's bill per Florida politics. That's some news outlet. It defines CBDCs as digital currencies validated directly by a foreign government. So is Bitcoin validated by El Salvador? Because if El Salvador is running a node, which I'm sure they are, uh, if they're running a node, then they are validating transactions. But Bitcoin itself is not validated by any particular foreign government. You know, it's global. So there is confusion about that. I can see how there could be confusion around the language used. Now, makes me think of the word validated and how that's used in the New York mining moratorium. They said that proof of work validates transactions. So they, they banned proof of work for anything where they used proof of work, oh, sorry, uh, proof of work was banned for anything uh, where it validated transactions, but proof of work doesn't validate transactions. Nodes validate transactions. So this is an interesting kind of confusion of language that isn't very well understood, even by Bitcoiners. Uh, but anyway, this is an interesting development. And I will, am very interested to see what happens to this over the next few months. It does feel like there is heating up in the world for a CBDC, mainly out of the Davos crowd. And I think you can really see these this stark contrast right now. Um, so you have Davos, obviously, Europe, ECB, the EU, uh, you know, Brussels and Frankfurt, basically. <laughs> Brussels and Frankfurt and London, they are all into this Davos crowd. And as well as Washington, D.C. But the Federal Reserve, no. The Federal Reserve is not on board. You can see these battle lines being drawn. And CBDCs are definitely being backed by the globalist globalists out of Davos. The Fed has continually stiff-armed this. And now we see the states, not Washington, D.C., but the states starting to also push back against this globalist CBDC type of takeover. Very, very interesting. And that's where I'm going to end it today, guys. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep the mic open over on Telegram for a little bit. So if you guys are watching live streaming on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, 
you got to join the telegram to have an open mic here at the end of a lot of these different episodes. But anyway, thanks for joining me, guys. Hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.